I am just so grateful. I woke up this morning so excited and still really tired, but also <laughs> very, very excited about what God, what God did on Friday. I'm so grateful for all of our volunteers who came and helped us put this together, our sponsors, and then just prayers that went into it. So ultimately, God, God showed up in a powerful way. And so it, it was really, really, really an amazing event. I'm grateful for you guys for, for promoting it, celebrating it with us, and, and just lighting up the night. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a quick announcement from my wife. She's not here. I'm going to read this in her voice. No, I'm not. But I will read the text. I'm going to read the text. Uh, there is a, a women's event that she wants me to make sure that I, that I re- remind you about. Friday, this Friday the 8th. Okay, I'm going to read this text word for word, okay? This is my wife for you. This Friday the 8th is one of our summer gatherings for food, fellowship, and fun. We have decided to move it from the Mineola Nature Preserve to our fellowship hall so we don't catch on fire or barbecue ourselves in this high heat. <laughs> please, R- please RSVP by ma- emailing Sarah at sarah at roseheights.org or text her. And I'll give you her number if you don't have it. We will need a headcount for food. Grab a postcard for it in the lobby on your way out. All right. Just wanted to make sure I got the message across. So that's from Sarah. She sends her love. So also, yes, I want to celebrate. Uh, I want to acknowledge today is we're, we're, we're getting into Independence Day weekend, you know, and I'm just grateful for for how our country began, and I want to continue to believe. You know, I, I love this saying that, you know, yes, God bless America, but may America bless God. That's the prayer of my heart, that we return to being a nation, and that we bless God, that we make much of him. You know, um, this is a funny story that you're going to wonder, why are you telling this story? Um, there was a man in New York he went viral back in March and uh, for living in a tree. He built a tree house, and he, his house was being dismantled by the authorities because he was in a public park, so they wanted to dismantle his home and move him somewhere else more permanent. And while, he was dismantling, while they were dismantling his, his home, uh, some reporters came and were taking pictures of him and thought it was just a fun photo op. And so the guy they called Squirrel Man got off the tree with a tree branch and was whacking the photographer and the reporter in the head, and every, nobody died. But anyway, you hear a story like that, and you're wondering, there's a story there somewhere. We hear a headline like Squirrel Man, and we're like, there's got to be more to this story than just a man living in a tree. Somewhere along the line, some, there was a series of events that led him to where he was. And right now you're wondering, why did you even tell that story? What was the point of that? Well, I kind of wanted to because it's about a man who went up in a tree, and we're talking about a man who was in a tree today as well. So it kind of, in a way, in a roundabout way, will connect. But when I, if I say his name right now, you're going to be singing about this wee little man, and the wee little man is he. So I won't say his name just yet. But, you know, I was in Guatemala just a few weeks ago, and... Uh, we were coming back home, and it seemed like everything was against us to get back home. I, I was missing my wife and my kids and my family so, so much, really ready to be home and uh, get back to yelling at my kids again. No, I'm just kidding. But getting back to just re- regular family life. So on our way home, we missed our flight because it was t- there was a torrential downpour, and the streets were flooding, and there was actually bridges collapsing. And it was pretty serious. Uh, We got to the airport. We missed our flight because of the horrible rain. So they rerouted us to Miami, Florida. And so, you know, I can't say we got stuck in Miami with a straight face, but we got stuck in Miami. They they sent us back to Miami, Florida, but at least we were back back in the States is kind of what our our thinking was. Let's just at least get back to the U.S. So we got back to the U.S. What we found out when we got to Miami was that they had not actually connected us with, for the DFW flight the following morning. So we didn't have a confirmed flight. So they sent us home, and then we had basically just a one-way ticket to Miami. Well, after, after hours of being at the airport trying to work things out, we were finally able to get a, get a flight the next morning or the next afternoon. So we got to spend some, a couple, like an hour or so at the beach and just kind of unwind and breathe. But again, I was ready to get home, missing my family. So, you know, when uh, 
the afternoon we were on our way, or we got to the airport, we were about to go home. We got our, t- our tickets. Now, my ticket was, was handed to me, and it said, C gate agent for ticket assignment, or for seat assignment. And I was like, what does that mean? What now? So we got to the gate. I go talk to the gate agent, and they say, hello, sir. Okay, please stand by. We will assign your seat momentarily. And so they start boarding the plane. Everyone is getting on the plane. I come to find out that I am on standby. They put, I was a confirmed ticket, but somehow I end up on the standby list. And I'm watching my whole team get on the plane, and I told our, team, our other team leader, Amanda, I said, you know what? Uh, if I don't make it home on this flight, I'm just going to rent a car and drive home because I guarantee you I will beat everybody home before, <laughs> before the plane lands. And so anyway, what's crazy is that next thing I know, the gate agent looks at me and says, you, come on. So I grabbed my bag. I didn't wait. I didn't turn around. I just ran and got on the plane because I was thinking, what if he changes his mind? So I get on the plane, literal last person. My, my seat was A32, which is like one of the very, very back of the plane seats. So I walk onto this plane, and I'm looking for my seat, and I find that my seat is between a couple. And they're a married couple, and yet here I am wedged between them. And I was wanting to ask, do you guys want to sit together? And they didn't. They were there, oh, we're fine. So I sit down next to this married couple. And yeah, I I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to watch a movie. So I put in my earbuds. I'm about to watch a movie. And the guy next to me, he said, so what were you doing in Guatemala? I said, we we were on a mission trip. And we're going to ask what we're doing in Miami, of course. We're coming back from Guatemala. We were on a mission trip. And he said, what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I'm a pastor. And then he said, my wife needs a pastor. (laughs) And I was, hi, what's your name? And she said, she said, I have so much anxiety I have been filled with anxiety for about two years. My, my mom died, and then four months later, my sister died. And I have been just an anxious wreck ever since. And I just getting on an airplane fills me with anxiety, getting in the car, going to work, going to the grocery store. Everywhere I go, I'm just filled with anxiety. And so I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yes, please. And I grabbed both of their hands, and I prayed for them right then and there. And uh, she thanked me. She said it, she was uh, very grateful that she ran into me. And the man, the husband, looked at me and he said, so you're a pastor. When did, how did you know that God called you to be a pastor? And so I told him kind of my story. And he, I asked him about kind of what, where they go to church, where they're from. And they, he said, well, I'm a Muslim. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. How, do you, how does this work? You, you're, you're married to a Christian, you're a Muslim. Because she, she watches all these guys on TV. And... Anyway, I was kind of a little bit terrified because I was like, God, am I supposed to minister to this man? Am I supposed to say more? And I I just felt this conviction and also this terror because honestly, I never had a conversation one-on-one with a Muslim man about the Lord. And so I I, I was feeling the conviction that, man, God doesn't make mistakes. And I was like, Lord, I don't think... I think I prayed out loud. That was probably enough. She, he probably got the picture, so that's going to plant a seed, and then eventually he'll come to Christ. And I heard the Holy Spirit say in gentle, loving, Holy Spirit conviction, how do you know you're getting off this plane today? And I was like, aren't I? And I felt this conviction of why do we assume why do we assume that someone else will plant the seed or someone else will water the seed when we, it's possible, it just may be possible that God placed us there to plant or water the seed. And so he asked me this one more question. He said, at the end of your life, how will you feel you have succeeded and that you were faithful and that you were you had a, you'd done a job well done in your, in your career. 
And I said, okay, Lord, that, that feels like a home run. You gave, me a, you gave me a softball. I said, here's what I would know. Here's what I will feel. If on the pulpit or on the airplane, I can share the love of Jesus with conviction and the same compassion with every individual, I will feel like I, I, I did what I, was, what I was called to do. And so from there, I told him, you know, every other religion reaches out to God. It's man's attempt to reach God, but the Bible teaches that actually God is reaching towards man. And I got to tell about Jesus, how Jesus is the Word made flesh, God made flesh, reaching out to man. And I was able to share the gospel with this man who was one of the most gentle and and very humble men I've ever met. And his wife looked at me and she said, I'm going to go home and tell my daughter. I met a preacher on the plane, and for the first time in years, I don't have any anxiety. And then I was able to pray for this man's knee because he had replacement surgery and he was still in pain. And I was just asking God to give him one more indication that he knows his name and that he knows his needs and that he's a God who touches and a God who heals because he is the same God. And we exchanged numbers. And this man said something I'll never forget on the way home. He said, we're going to be passing through Shreveport quite a bit. I'm not a Christian, but I want to come to your church. And so I hope and pray to see that man someday. But here's what I realized I realized that this this couple, they didn't know that they were on an assignment. They didn't know that they had an an appointment, and neither did I. But we are the church. We've been talking about the church, hope for the world. And if we are the church, we need to remember that we're always to be looking for those appointments. That maybe, maybe your run to the grocery store is not just a run to the grocery store. You need to be prepared. I need to be prepared because there may be and probably will be someone who is needing to hear what you have to say. Amen? And so as we're talking about being the church, we're going to look at a man, this wee little man, the wee little man was he, named Zacchaeus, who he was just trying to get a glimpse and he ended up having an appointment with Jesus. So let me read Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and he was unable due to the crowd because he was short in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him because he was about to pass that way Jesus was. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried home and came came down and received him joyfully. When the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'm giving to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'm giving back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This morning, if I could preach this message in one sentence, it would be this. The church is a place where sinful sinners can find hope. Let's pray real quick. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, I just pray that you help us to remember that you have appointments with people. People, everyone will stand before you one day. God, may we we do everything in our power to help prepare those, those we come in contact with to stand before you. Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart for the lost. Lord, I pray that you would just give us boldness. Lord, I pray that we would have that same spirit that Paul had where he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. God, help us to live and believe that the gospel truly is the power of God unto salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I mentioned sinful sinners, and so 
some of us are thinking, what, is, what does that actually mean? Well, there are actually there are three types of sinners that are, we, sh- we see in the Bible. There are, there are good sinners. Those are who, people moral, who are moral people, who don't realize they're, they're not walking with the Lord. Or maybe they don't believe in God. They, maybe they're atheist or agnostic, but they, they're still good people with a moral compass for some reason. They, they still want to do good and treat people with kindness. And, you know, even the man on the plane that I got to sit next to, again, he made an impression on me, one of the most gentle people I've ever met. And though he doesn't know Jesus at, here and now yet, I'm praying that he will, there, I still, I loved him instantly. And then there are those, there are ignorant sinners, and when I say ignorant, I don't mean that as an insult, I mean that in the literal sense of the word, it just means to be without knowledge. That's what it literally means. So, they don't know, they just don't know. That, may, may, maybe, maybe, many agnostics might fall in the category of being, of being an ignorant sinner. They're, they don't know, and they're honestly, desperately seeking, and sincerely seeking to know the truth. But then there are sinful sinners who do, they do know the truth. They do know that they're sinning and they don't care. In fact, they, they're going to push against God no matter what. They, they're proud. They're, bo- they're bold, you know, bold and boastful in their sin. And so Zacchaeus kind of falls into that category. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and tax collectors were looked upon even by the rabbis. In fact, there are documents from rabbis in the time of Jesus comparing tax collectors to robbers armed robbers because they extort and they take more in fact they were authorized by Rome to be able to take more than than the person owed so they were able to name their price and they would give Rome what was due Rome and they would take over and above for themselves and so Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector so he was like the district manager of tax collectors in fact he was even able to extort from his fellow tax collectors because he was their boss he was their supervisor and so he was a sinful sinner. He worked in Jericho. Jericho was a very wealthy place. In fact, it was, there was a very famous balsam grove. Balsam was a very, is, is a spice, and it's a very expensive spice. So there was a lot of wealth in Jericho, a population of about between five and 10,000 people. Of course, we know it as a place where the walls fell down, but, but even then, people would, or Jericho would, would tax people as they came in. They had to pay a toll to go to Jerusalem. And I'm sure Zacchaeus had, he was able to get his due from the tolls as well. He would find any, any way he could to get what he, what he wanted. And so that's the reputation that, that Zacchaeus had. And that's what the, the reputation of tax collectors. So he was also, of course, we know this to be short. He was short. He was literally, physically short. So imagine that. That's your description in the Bible. You're, you're a, he, he was a Jew. He was a son of Abraham a tax collector, the chief tax collector, and he's short. And I'm sure now Zacchaeus is like, Lord, did you have to put that in there? Could we not have maybe just said something about my glowing personality instead? But no, it mentions, Luke mentions that he's very short, that he was short. And we know this because also because he had to climb a tree to see Jesus. He was doing everything he could because he was short. So that is the picture we have of this man, this chief sinner who was bold in his sin, who, who was even proud of his sin. He was wealthy and everybody knew where he got his money. And so, verse 3 strikes me, though. Because in verse 3, I'll read it real quick. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. And I'm sure we all agree that he was literally trying to get a glimpse of Jesus from the sycamore tree because he was too short. But it wasn't just for scientific consideration that he wanted to get a glimpse. I think he wanted to see more. I think he wanted to see if Jesus was who he said he was. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so he climbs this tree because he wanted to see who Jesus was. You know, as we read this story, three things that stand out. The first one is this. Sometimes followers of Jesus can block sinners from seeing Jesus. We're supposed to be the salt, the light of the world, right? And yet sometimes we are the very people standing in the way. Maybe intentionally, 
like in, in fact, just a previous chapter in Mark chapter, in Luke chapter 18, verses 35 to 43, there was a man by the roadside. As they're walking towards Jerusalem, a man who was a blind man crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me because he had heard the commotion around him because people were seeing Jesus is here. And so when he found out that Jesus was here, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He called him the son of David, recognizing immediately this is the Messiah. As a blind man, he had no doubt heard that this is a man who could fix that. And as he's crying out for redemption, as he's crying out people around him, the very ones who were excited to see Jesus are pushing this man out, and they're saying, they're telling him to be quiet as he's shouting out. But I'm sorry, don't you think that if you are blind and you know that the cure for your blindness is standing right there and walking is going to be passing by, at some point, dignity goes out the road, out the window, because Jesus is the one who can fix this. And so he's crying out, and the people are saying, be quiet. And that grieves me, and it probably should grieve you too, right? Because sometimes I think we do that. Maybe not us, but I'm talking about universally in the body of Christ. Sometimes there's a saying, you may be the only Jesus someone will ever meet. And that's true, because a majority of the United States population I'm, I'm forgetting the exact percentage, but they all claim to be Christian. I think it's about 70 or so percent. But if Jesus, if we're the only picture they see of Jesus, does Jesus belittle people because of their tattoos? Or does Jesus reject someone because of their sin. Let me ask you this question. If the lady at the airport behind the counter found out you were a Christian, would you be embarrassed by your conversation? Or would you be justified? If the lady in the car behind you, or the man, this is not a, this is not a dig on women drivers, I promise. <laughs> you guys okay? I'm just joking. I promise. I'm, I promise. I really, in fact, I wasn't even planning on saying that, but there, there it comes. But if the person in the car behind you or around you finds out you're a Christian, how will you feel later? Do you want them to know you're a Christian? Again, these questions should be challenging us to think, are you a good, accurate representation of Jesus? And none of us are perfect. Absolutely not. But sometimes we are the blockade for someone encountering the very thing, that will, the very person that will set them free. And sometimes it's, it's unintentional or intentional. I'm sorry, unintentional. Like the people who were gathered around Jesus in Jericho so Zacchaeus couldn't see. Now, they didn't like Jer Zacchaeus already. And of course, his short stature contributed to that as well. They wanted to see Jesus too. They weren't trying to block his view, but they did. But sometimes we without even realizing it, when we just have a, a business as usual mentality, sometimes we, we miss an appointment that someone might have with Jesus. When Jesus, we'll see in just a second, he was intentional everywhere he went. He was always prepared, always ready and looking to be that appointment with God. second thing is this. Jesus sees our potential and not our past. Jesus sees the church in a group of ragtag fishermen and country boys like me. Jesus, he sees the future of the church and people like you and me. 
God saw a king and a shepherd named David who was an illegitimate son, rejected by everybody else. God sees potential where everyone else sees the past. God sees what culture refuses to see. God looks beyond the surface. That's why, that's why he told, that the, the Lord told Samuel in, sec, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, don't look on his countenance. Man looks on the countenance, but God looks at the heart. Jesus saw something in Zacchaeus that told him, this man right here is ripe for being adopted in the family of God. I love this part. In verse 5, Jesus, it says, Jesus came to the place. The word for place is where we get, is actually a word that means appointment or fulfillment. So he came to the point of fulfillment. He came to the place of appointment. You know, if you're looking for a new house and you're, you, you and your family are driving around, you're looking at all these different houses, and some of them you're like, okay, that, that's a good one. Okay, I like that one. Okay, well, that, that one's okay. But then you get to the place, don't you? Because you look around and you look at each other and say, this is the place. Or maybe you've walked into a church and said, this is the place. Somehow we know when we're in the place. Jesus knew that he was in the place. He wasn't, it wasn't just about a matter of geography. Jesus said, this is the appointment. This is why I have walked through the gates of Jericho. Probably having to pay a tax to get in there. And yet Jesus was on assignment because he saw what we couldn't see. He saw the potential. How do we know that? Because in verse, I lost the verse. Because in verse 5, yeah. In verse 5, Jesus calls this chief tax collector by name. Okay, Zacchaeus, on the eighth day after he was born, was circumcised. He was given the name Zacchaeus. The name Zacchaeus means pure and innocent. That is hilarious for a man who is famous for extortion and robbery, even in the eyes of the rabbis. And yet, Jesus, he looks up. He's walking through the crowds. Again, Zacchaeus is trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. He's looking just to get a glimpse because he wants to see who Jesus is. But Jesus knows exactly where to look because he looks up at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, he calls him pure and righteous one. Probably the very first time he's been called his birth name with affection and concern and compassion. Everyone else probably has a name for Zacchaeus too, but it's probably not worth saying out loud here. But Jesus sees something in Zacchaeus, something in this seeker that he's drawn to. Pure and innocent one. Then he says this, hurry, hurry down. Today, today, I'm going to stay in your house. He says, hurry. Zacchaeus is called by his birth name. He's called what nobody else can see by the Messiah, the Savior of all mankind. When Jesus calls your name, when Jesus, the one who can see your potential beyond your past, calls your name, we don't delay. That's why he said, hurry. There's nothing left in your old life to hold on to, Zacchaeus. Hurry, don't sit in that tree for one more moment. Jesus, I'm sure, had some questions to ask Zacchaeus. Jesus had some things to say to Zacchaeus. But he wasn't going to do it right there in the tree. Hurry down. So when we hear Jesus calling our name, we hurry. I remember the day. I remember how it felt when I heard the gospel and that seed was planted and watered and I rushed to the altar. It almost felt like I couldn't control it. 
and I wanted to hurry. I, there was, I didn't want anything else more than that in this moment to go see what Jesus has to say. I'm coming to your house today, he says. Third thing is this. The evidence of our transformation is found in our home because then Zacchaeus, he, he climbs down the tree with joy, happily, excited. And then he talks about how he's going to repay fourfold what he's stolen. It's interesting that he wanted to start at home. And I believe it's for a couple of reasons. I mean, there's that saying, home is where the heart is. Home is where the guard is down. You know, when you go to someone's house, you're seeing the down-to-earth, hair-let-down version of a person. The most authentic version of ourselves is at home. Jesus is saying, let's go to your house. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to go to you on your terms, on your on your turf. And what happens next is that Zacchaeus can't contain it. He can't help himself. And so he, he, he's overflowing with wanting to re- just repay everything and, and make amends and make it right. When Jesus comes, when he changes our hearts, he changes our culture. So, so Jesus is walking into his house. And you know what's interesting is that the people are grumbling about this whole thing. They're watching it unfold. And Jesus is saying, today I'm going to be in your house. Hurry, hurry down. The people are grumbling. And they're saying, how dare he? This guy wants to go have lunch with this man. He's going to stay in the house of a known sinner. You know, there's a, there's a man named Kenneth Bailey. And Kenneth Bailey was a Middle Eastern scholar. And he lived in the Middle East for, for most of his life. And he's a biblical commentator. And he talked about how the culture of honor and shame is still very much alive in Middle Eastern culture, even after thousands of years. Where honor is what a Middle Eastern family strives for. And shame is what people will, will avoid like the plague. And so, what is happening here is more than meets the eye. Because Jesus is seen as a man of honor. Honor, again, is very attractive. Everybody wants honor in a Middle Eastern culture. They're flocking to be honored. They're flocking to honor. And so Jesus, this king, this man of honor, comes into the city. And who does this king choose to stay with? But the chief tax collector of the city. What this means is speaking much more volumes than the text reads in in and of itself. But what it really means is this. Jesus is saying, I'm going to honor you as a person of honor staying in your house. I'm bringing honor upon your house. And everybody knew that, which is why they were upset. Because him staying there was, Jesus was showing Zacchaeus honor. And so what's interesting about this is that transformation takes place. When, when, he, when he says, I'm coming, I'm coming to your house. Transformation begins to set in and, and Zacchaeus can't help himself and he, he says, I'm going to repay everything. When we allow Jesus to be the Lord of our home, the kingdom of, the culture of the kingdom comes into our home. Marriage issues so often are not just marriage issues. They're sonship issues. Who is your father? It's an issue of discipleship. It's not always just a matter of relationship, but when, when we catch, when we allow Jesus to come in and change the culture of our home, the culture of our heart, identity shifts from world to kingdom and that's what we see happening in the life of Zacchaeus he comes to transform our families he cares about our marriages he cares about our parenting and our relationships you know Jesus still keeps his appointments 
there are still people who are crying out, who have a fulfill or a longing to encounter, to get a glimpse of Jesus, to see who Jesus is, just like Zacchaeus. And before we go, I want to share a testimony of a man who his line of work centers around appointments. But then Jesus was the one setting the appointment. Let's watch this video of Austin Fry. Had a lot of structure and, and shelter in my life. I was pressured very heavily by my dad, who, uh, who did more harm than good, although I know in his heart he always meant good. I was first baptized when I was 13. I never really knew what it meant. It felt more like pressure. It felt like more obey or else. That really kind of pushed me away from religion and I fell off into a bad way. You know, I started experimenting with drugs and partying and boozing and, you know, all the things that the cool kids do. Um, Late January of 2012, just a few months after I met my wife, which is, us, is why I call her my unspoken prayer, my grandpa committed suicide. My mom had asked me to go check up on him, and, and being, you know, the young 21, 22-year-old that I was, you know, I thought I had more important things to do. But I was able to finally make it over there on my own terms and I walked into his house, you know, hollering out his name. And the very last place that I came to was his closet in his bedroom and I opened the door and found him there with the gun on his chest and a pillow over his head. That was a big turning point in my life and it wasn't a turn for the best. You know, they say that you're not a product of your circumstances, but you do have a choice. You got two rows to go down, and I definitely chose the wrong one. The, uh, the drug use and the, and the alcohol abuse just got worse, and it got worse. This went on for years. Went through a separation, and like a lot of other people, my rock bottom was at the bottom of a bottle. And it was finally my kids witnessing everything. It was the alcohol getting brought my teenage son to tears. My seven year old, he didn't know what was going on. And it's always the next morning that's the hardest because you didn't know what you had done the night before. I was on the way to work. I had some worship music playing and I just turned it off. I broke down. I was in tears and screaming, just screaming at myself for all the hurt that I've put my family through over the years. My wife, she was at the forefront of it all. It was in that moment in the truck, I was just, I called out called out for for Jesus. I called out for a savior. And it was at that point where I surrendered my life. I haven't had a drop of alcohol since that day. And I promised my kids that I would never drink again. I was still smoking weed. And I asked God, I was like, if I'm doing wrong by, by smoking weed, Lord, I pray that you send somebody that knows you to give me clarity and confirmation on whether or not I'm doing wrong by you. Before the day had even started, I, I prayed that prayer and I, I opened up my devotional at, shortly after that and it talked about revival without reform. And that kind of struck a nerve with me. Well, I knew my worship pastor, Brandon Kaiser, was coming in later that day. So I, I spoke with him and I asked him about, you know, the situation and, and got some ministering from him and he told me straight up, you know, just, you can't, you can't manipulate scripture to fit your lifestyle. And that hit home and it made a lot of sense. The very end of that exact same day, a missionary walks into the barbershop and she didn't even know it. 
she was an answered prayer and she was my confirmation. From that point forward, I put it down. I haven't done it again. It was in August of 2021 where Brandon had, had baptized me and my wife both. You know, every day I surrender my, my goals and my ambitions, my dreams over to the Lord. And every time that I've tried to control the situation, it always ends in chaos. And since I have been surrendering everything to God, it has been victory. Dreams have been fulfilled. The want and the desire for anything is non-existent. All I do is put my faith, my trust in God and keep moving forward. He is my provider. He is my refuge. He is my strength. Above all that, He is my Savior. Isn't that amazing? Let's give God a hand. Today we have a privilege of seeing Mr. Austin Fry here in person. Would you come up to the stage with me, Austin? I'm just so proud, just so grateful for what God's done in your life and, you know, just seeing uh, just as, as Zacchaeus' story in some ways panning out and restoration in your family and and your life and everything, it's just its so powerful to see that, you know, again, I, I was hearing your testimony and making, making that correlation about, man, this is a man whose life centers around appointments, and yet there's this day where Jesus was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet out, I'm going to reach out for Austin Fry, and your testimony is going to be so powerful and profound for so many people, and uh, I think thousands, and I'm just uh, grateful for how the Lord's used you, so... I want to pray over Austin and also by extension pray over you as well. And many of us have people in our lives that we, maybe we've been, we've been praying for for years and maybe even given up on praying for because we haven't seen anything happen yet. But, you know, there's an appointment coming. Like Austin, there was a moment where Jesus stepped in and it was so undeniable. And maybe somebody here today is even a sinful sinner like Zacchaeus. But you want to get that glimpse of Jesus. And you feel like God's, he, he had brought you here by appointment. I want to pray over Austin. And at the very end, I'd like to invite you to come forward. And if you need prayer, we're here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the power of redemption. Lord, I thank you for Austin. I thank you, Jesus, for the things that you've done in his life, Lord. Thank you for the authenticity of his testimony, for letting him be transparent and share the struggles that he faced, God, that were very hard. And in his mind, he probably had no idea how we'd get through any of it. And yet you were laying a foundation every step of the way, I just thank you, God, that for the day that you met Austin Fry where he was and that you used your people, you used Pastor Brandon and a missionary. And may uh, God, may we all have that heart, that mentality. May we always be on assignment like that missionary, just always prepared. Lord, like your word says, to give a hope, to give the reason for the hope that we have today. Thank you for the power of testimony. I pray, Lord, for those who are, those of us who are praying for, for a sinner that we know who, who just, they've rejected you and resisted you. But, Lord, there's a time coming, God. We know that if they call upon you, Lord, that everything changes. That when you, when you walk into the room, God, that things change. So, God, we pray for their testimony. We pray for that time, that appointment to come. And, God, may they be like Austin. I love that word, he, that phrase he said, that revival without reform. May there, we, we see before us a man 
who was revived and reformed. Lord, like Zacchaeus, he was revived and reformed. He, he didn't just accept Jesus into his life and, and then just keep doing things the way he did. He gave, he gave Jesus lordship and he turned and he made restitution. God, this was reform. This was a, a changed heart. And we see that in Austin. And God, that's, we see it happening in his family. And we just thank you, God, for who you are, that you are a God of reformation, a God of restoration. And we just pray, Lord Jesus, if there's anybody here who, who would say, yes, I'm, I'm a Zacchaeus, or Austin's story sounds familiar to me too, that you would draw them and just say, Lord, like Jesus, hurry, hurry, because today I'm going to your house. And may they see reformation in their own homes. May they see rest, restoration in their own homes. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the God who reforms, the God who restores, the God who redeems, because you are the God that rescues. We pray blessings over Austin and his family in the days and the weeks and the months to come and the years to come, that you continue to use his testimony, Lord, to transform lives. I pray blessings on their marriage. I pray for their, for their children. God, that the, the, mention, the worship of your name would be in their house and on their lips and everything they say and do. God, that many of his clients who come to, come to get appointments don't realize it, but they're sitting in the chair of a man who is called by God to, to speak restoration and to speak hope and life over them. I pray that you would just give him boldness. God, give him just the compassion for every, sing, every single person that he, that he meets in us as well, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. As we go out, let's say this together. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen, amen. God bless you guys.